Good, good morning. I'd like to ever, ever welcome everyone to our Sunday morning uh, Bible class. Um, we're in the book of Nehemiah, and we are finishing chapter 5. And so we got down through about chap verse 13 of chapter 5 last last week. And so we just got a little bit more here to discuss. And, and just to kind of kind of go back and and uh, remember what was going on here in the first part of chapter five, is remember they had had a lot of pressure for them to quit building the wall from the outside, from their enemies. And now in chapter five, there's a problem from inside because the people are some of the nobles and some of the other people are are using the people and making them high interest loans. And they're worried about being able to eat and having to borrow money to feed their families. And so we're having this internal pressure on the, on the, on the people there from working on the walls. And Nehemiah makes them stop doing all that, makes them basically give back what they've already taken. And now we're going to look at in, in verses 14 to the end of the chapter is that Nehemiah has been leading and is going to continue to lead by his example of how he is going to to deal with the um, with the the people there, the, the Israelites that are working on the wall. And we can see that a lot of times in in the leadership or in parenting, which I guess would be leading the family, is that people will say one thing and do another, right? So if our leaders were to say, you all need to sacrifice and do this for the work, but they aren't willing to do that, that's not going to go very far, is it? It's going to be poor leadership. And it's going to be selfish leadership whenever the leaders are not willing to participate and do what, the, what they expect the people they're leading to do. So let's look at verses 14 through the end of the chapter. Moreover, from the day that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, the 20th year to the, to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, for 12 years, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took them bread and wine, and besides 40 shekels of silver, even their servants domineered the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also applied myself to the work on this wall. We did not buy any land. All of my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 Jews and officials besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now that which was prepared for each day was one ox, six choice sheep, also birds were prepared for me. And once in 10 days, all sorts of wine were furnished in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on this people. Remember me, oh my God, for, for good according to all that I have done for this people. So we see that Nehemiah led by his example the whole time that he was there in the governor. Now, most likely Nehemiah had a pretty good paying job with the king, right? And so he probably came and had, you know, some money that he had saved or was continuing to get, to get, you know, compensation from, from the Persian king, from Artaxerxes. Because if you had, first of all, if you had your cupbearer, you're going to want him to be pretty well taken care of, right? You're going to be somebody that's going to be, you're going to be depending on, so you're going to pay that person, you know, pretty well. And so Nehemiah comes there. And even though a lot of people, you know, some people are paid well, we see that they may still use their power to take advantage of a situation. Do we see that ever in our society today, in our government, where a politician or a leader would enrich themselves based on their power and use that to, you know, and, and oftentimes we even it's even done in in things like that, like. You know, they get paid an exorbitant amount to go give a speech somewhere. Well, that, that they're not getting paid. There's nothing they're going to say that's worth what they're getting paid. We, we can recognize that that's probably just them paying back for some type of favor. But we don't see Nehemiah do that. And the first thing it says there, I think, that he said, 
<clears throat> the first thing he did, he didn't take a salary. So he didn't even, the regular governors got paid a pretty good salary there in Jews. So he didn't even take that. He, he, he let that, that go. He didn't take that. Also, one of the things that says in here is that he didn't buy any land. Um, what, 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 what does that signify? Do people in power oftentimes know the best land deals that are out there maybe? Do they know the people that are maybe in trouble financially and could take advantage of them? Maybe I'm late on my payment on my farm and the government, he probably knows that. And so they would say like, we're going to come and offer you, you know, we'll buy you out for what you owe and something like that. So we see that Nehemiah, did, we see he didn't even do that. And also we see that he, that he was helping the people versus, you know, trying to take advantage of the situation. It's what these people were doing to the Jews there. For now, they were taking advantage of them. Nehemiah shows that he is not taking that. He doesn't take a salary. He doesn't need the food. He doesn't buy the land. And he reminds them of how much they were having to pay the other, the other governors. And why did he not do this? Is it because he was a good guy down inside, deep inside? Is that the reason? Maybe. Maybe. What's the reason that he gives us there in verse uh, 15? He may have been a good guy. He probably was. Clearly he was. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. So now, if you're in a situation or I'm in a situation where we have some type of power or authority in the church or in the world, would we use, why would we not take advantage and do something that's inappropriate? Because of the same reason as Nehemiah, right? The fear of God. And so we see that he didn't do this. It may, because he doesn't say, it's not because I didn't want to own some more land. It's not because I didn't want to, take the governor's salary. I didn't do it because I feared God. And so we see that he feared God and that's why he didn't do that. Also here in verse 16, he didn't just not take advantage of the people. What was he doing instead of that? He says, see, I applied myself to the work on the wall. And this is, this is the part here where it talks about him not buying any land. And then he says also, that all his servants were gathered to do that work. So he helped with the construction. He didn't buy any cheap land up, and he even had his own personal servants doing the work on the wall. And so that is complete contrast to what the other nobles were doing by taking advantage of the, 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 the Jews. And then also it says here in verse 17, he was, not only was he working on the wall, he was... He had 150 people regularly at his table that he was feeding and taking care of them. I would assume this is during the construction of the wall. Would you all like to take 150 people out to lunch today? Let's just say, what's the most, the least expensive restaurant we could go to? I don't know. Huh? Vending machine? Taco Bell used to be, that was the, the idea of inexpensive food. I don't know if it is necessarily anymore, but so if, even if you go and get a value meal, that's going to cost you $10, right? Probably 10 bucks. You get a big, was it, Wendy's got the biggie for $5 or $6 or something? Five big, five, I don't remember what it is. But anyway, this is not a cheap thing. And so he's 150 people and he lists the amount of food that they were eating. Each day they prepared one ox. So I, you can imagine an ox being the size, yeah, I, I picture an ox about the size of a cow, six sheep. So this is not a small undertaking, is it? You know, 150 people are eating, they're eating a lot. And he, it appears that he's paying for this out of his own pocket. And so he is not taking advantage of them, but he is providing for them so that they can do the work. 
Um, and he did all this out of, you know, out of, out of his own pocket. Um, and then I think in verse, in verse 19, there he says, remember me, oh my God, for good, according to all I have done for this people. So he asked in this, this, this seems like a prayer to me. He's asking that God to remember him and remember what he's done for these people and for the work on the wall. Does anybody have any thoughts on the, on chapter five here? Which one of these two um, scenarios would do better as far as getting the work done? The scenario where you have the leaders taking advantage of the people, or you have Nehemiah, the leader, who is taking care of the people at his own expense and through his own efforts. Which one of them is going to be more productive? It's obviously one where the least work with those people would be more productive it's because of the same thing today is we consider if we're living for the Lord and serving the Lord and everything we do, we're going to advance more so in God's way, everyone's going to do the right thing. All people will benefit it, as opposed to being self centered and always trying to put yourself up above others, as we see in our society today. Yeah, so we see, clearly we can see that the Nehemiah's method is going to be more productive on getting the work done. But if you're looking at it from an individual standpoint, individually, who was it more productive for? Who's getting more gain? Noble or the Nehemiah? Clearly the nobles were. And so we need to look at that in our lives. Whenever we are dealing with each other and with people of the world, we can gain more by using our power to mistreat people, right? Matt? Things that God often brings to work like this. It's the fact that they have a shared understanding, a shared set of values, a shared goal. The Jewish people here are coming together and, and working towards something that will be to the benefit of, of you know, and glory of God. Uh, and the benefit of themselves, glory of God. And very few things can do that quite like God and serving God. Uh, you know, with, with teams, you know, so many of us have, uh, uh, you know, been in a setting where, you know, we have to do something for work. That's not as unifying and not as collective as religion is. And, and so there's a, a real benefit. And we need to remember that when we start things for the church is that we have that shared understanding, that shared goal, and that shared ability to then worship God that way. Uh, and that will, and any kind of effort that's aligned with the worship of God is hopefully less to, to succeed. All right, all right, very good comment. Any other comments? All right, let's go ahead and jump into chapter six then. Um, so now we've we've had pressure from the outside, we've had pressure from the inside, and now we're going to to um, to have more pressure from the outside, but in a different a different way because the it, the enemies of the Israelites there or the Jews are are continually changing their tactics when they don't work. Um, so let's read um, about the first, I don't know, let's read the first nine verses. Now, when it was reported to Samballot, Tobiah, to Gesh and the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although it, at that time it had I had not set the doors and the gates. Then Samballot and Geshen sent a message to me saying, come, let us meet together at Chephram in the, in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come to you and come down to you? They sent messengers to me four times in this manner. And I answered them in the same way. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me in the same manner a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem says that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall and that you are to be their king according to these reports. You have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you as king 
concerning a king is in Judah. And now it be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. Then I sent a message to him saying, such things as you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. So now they've tried to come in and they started out, remember they started out ridiculing them, hoping that make them stop. And then they, um, the next thing they did was they tried to, you know, stop them militarily. But we see that Nehemiah had a plot to stop that by arming them and having them fill in the gates. We talked or the holes in the, in the wall. We talked about that last week. But now they're going to try to use what I'm going to call political maneuvers and the idea that they're going to also try to assassinate Nehemiah alone. And so the first thing they do is they, they send a letter saying, hey, come out and meet us in the, in the, out here in the, this place, this plain of Ono. He's a, he would be away from his protection, right? He, he would have protection there in Jerusalem. He would have, and so they had this idea they were going to try to get him out there and they were going to try to harm him out there. And so he realizes that because he's not, because he's, you know, he's shrewd enough to realize that he's not going to go out and make himself vulnerable. So they did that four times, I think is what it says. And he refuses them every time. So I need to stay here and keep doing my work. And so now they're frustrated. They say, what do we do? Let's send him an open letter, a letter that's been opened. So what's the significance of this letter that has been opened? Have you all ever gotten anything in the mail that was opened? What, do you, what does that mean that... Somebody could have seen it, Eddie. So these charges that they're making against the Abiah were really were to be disseminated to everybody. They wanted everybody to know that hey, the Abiah is trying to become king. Right, and so this is the idea that this wasn't just like a you know the mailman you know carelessly tossing your mail in. This is a letter that was given to one specific person that probably had a seal on it. And when it comes, the seal's broken. And obviously, he's read it, and the news is going to be, it's being spread throughout the interior of Jerusalem and throughout the people around there. And so this, they're saying that Nehemiah is claiming he's going to pronounce himself king. And what would be the problem with that? Was there already a physical king in that area? Were they under the control of another kingdom? And so what would happen if our governor, you know, decided to make him king of Kentucky? And we're not going to have anything else to do with the United States. That would be, you know, the rest of the United States would be like, you can't do that because that's Kentucky is part of the USA. And so, even more so, they had a, a king, and he would come in and conquer Jerusalem again, right, and tear down the wall. Eddie? It's the same charge made against Jesus by the Jews in front of Pilate. He calls himself the king of the Jews. Exactly. And the Romans were in charge of the physical territory. They were the physical kings of that area at the time. That's a good point. It's the same charge as made against Jesus. And so... This is a false charge, but this charge is going to be given and shown that they're saying this. All the people in Jerusalem are going to know, and they're going to and the people in Jerusalem are going to say, "Wait, if they're saying this, and this gets back to the king, he's going to come and conquer us." So, what might be the result of that inside the walls of Jerusalem? If our governor was saying he's king and we're afraid the army's going to come in and attack Kentucky, what are we going to do to our governor? We're going to go up there and say, you're not the governor anymore, get out, because we don't want tanks rolling into Lexington, right, or Frankfurt. And so that's possibly the reaction that could have happened. They could have said, Nehemiah, you're out, because this is too dangerous. And so, but Nehemiah, and so, and so maybe Nehemiah's going to try to, they're trying to get Nehemiah to react to this 
also. And so we see that, that he doesn't. And so, and they're still trying to stop all this work on the wall. And so I think that's very interesting, this open letter. And it may have caused internal rebellion and also may have been able to lure him out where they could. You know, maybe he would come out to answer these charges. But he tells them, he says, this is all made up in your head. You're all just making up a bunch of charges against me that are false, trying to get a reaction, trying to persuade public opinion. Does that happen today? All right, a very good point about the, the, the kind of where I was, one of the thoughts I had was, so what, let's just think that something like this is happening within the church where somebody is, is making up something or they're twisting something about another brother to, for whatever purpose. If that's happening against us, if we just get into the argument and start we, it's easy. If somebody makes a false charge against you, what's the easiest thing to start doing to them? You know, turnabout's fair play, right? And so you would maybe go and talk to other people about them. That this is, and so that's not how we should react. We'd be like, like Dempsey said, and like Nehemiah did. He just keeps on doing his work um, and trusting in God. And so also we have to be careful that we have to be able to to have that have that focus on doing God's work rather than being popular. Um, did somebody else? Well, so he wasn't even, so she said he could have been tempted to say, hey, maybe I should make myself king. And so he wasn't, his, motive, his that was not his motivation to do that. Any other thoughts or comments on one through nine there? All right, let's read uh, verses uh, uh, 10 through 14. It says, when I entered the house of Shemai, the son of the lie, the, the son of Mehetabob, who was confined at home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the door of the temple for they are coming to kill you and are coming to kill you at night. But I said, should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceive that surely God has not sent him. But he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambel had hired him. He was hired for this reason that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin, so that they might have an evil report or that they could reproach me. Remember, O oh my God, to buy and Sambal according to these works of theirs, and also 
Noadiah, the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten me. So here we see that now their plan is they're going to try to get Nehemiah af afraid for his life and to go into the temple, which would be a sin for him to do, and to protect himself. Now, I'm going to ask this question. If Let's just assume for a second that that they're not, that, I don't know how to say this. Physically, does this make good, would this make good sense? Would this be a good hiding place for Nehemiah in the world? Without, to take out what God thinks about it. Would this be a good hiding, if somebody was trying to kill Nehemiah, would this be a good place for him to hide? Or you don't, not really? And then open it up, and it's just him and some other guy that's there. I mean, it'd be one of the first places I'd look if I were, you know, that Gentile trying to find it. Okay. So you think it might be a good place? Doesn't think it'd be a good hiding spot. Maybe they would be afraid to go into the temple because of the other Jews. But whether or not you think it's, we think it's a good hiding spot or not, if somebody was using common sense, they may be able to conclude this is a good hiding spot. But we see that it's not because it's forbidden for Nehemiah to be in there because he's not a priest, right? So now my question is, whenever we are faced with a spiritual dilemma, sometimes in our reasoning we can say, this makes sense for me to do this. I can reason through why I should accept this sin or participate in this sin or not fulfill this part of the law. Has anybody ever, I don't have an example, but have you ever seen somebody that would reason through something? It's okay for me to do this because even though I, it's it's wrong because this is, if we, Eddie? Satan tries to limit our options or at least limit our view of what our options are. And this man was presenting the new lineup, essentially just two options. Either you hide in the temple or you die. And Nehemiah said, first of all, well, if those are my only two options, then I am going to die because I'm not going to sin. But ultimately, he says, I realized that he was actually hired and that those weren't my only two options. And that's what Satan does to us, is try to limit us in what we see to only bad options, instead of recognizing that God provides a way of escape uh, in whatever situation we're in. Now, we may die, but the way of escape is that we're going to die in the world. All right. And that's ultimately what he comes to realize is the fact that these options that he's been presented with are not the only two options. Okay, good point. What what if if some type of sin is is uh, the people in the in the congregation are wanting to accept some type of sin, and they say and, and everybody reads, well, if we don't accept this, there's going to be we're going to lose a lot of membership. We can't. Just because we can, I guess the point I'm trying to make is just because we can make a worldly reason for something doesn't mean that we can do it. It's right. And we see that Nehemiah, he refuses to go in there. And so he's like, he's going to accept the consequences if, if he gets killed because he's not hiding in there. He's willing to accept those consequences. And so we can't use, I guess the point I'm making is we can't use our own personal judgment. We've got to rely on God's word. Is the, is the point I'm trying to make, and it's probably did a very poor job of doing it. Also, here, here in verse 11, he makes, it, he makes two statements. I guess they're questions. Should a man like me flee? What do y'all take of that statement or that? I guess that's a, what's, that, what's, the, what's the question called? It not really has an answer. What's that? Huh? What? Yeah, rhetorical question. That's what I was. And so, what type of man was Nehemiah? He was a man of God. 
He was their governor, their leader. And falsely accused. All right, very good point. So here we have, if if the leader is accused of doing something wrong and he runs and hides, we're going to say, well, he was doing whatever they said he was doing. He wasn't the, this godly person that he was or that he claimed to be. We see that we see that Nehemiah, he's not that. He is, he, he, the charges against him are false. He's there to the purpose to rebuild the wall. So he's not going to run and hide and flee. He's willing to accept any consequences. Also, the second, the second question, rhetorical question he has is, um, I'll get it here. And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? He was, as we've already talked about, he was a man of God. Can I violate God's law to save my life? I think in, in that he's saying that he would rather die than to violate God's law. I think he's also saying that if he violates God's law, he's going to die anyway, right? And that's the same, that's the same type of thing that we're that we have today. If we violate God's law, we're going to die. Can we violate that to save our, our lives? And so I think that we see that. And also I think he recognizes that these people that are trying to get him to do that are not from God. How does he recognize that? Exactly. He recognizes them as being false prophets because they're asking him to do something that is sinful. Um, so it should be easy for us to recognize when people are trying to influence us that they don't have godly interest in mind whenever what they are suggesting is not scriptural, right? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't that be a red flag? If someone says, this is what I think you should do in this situation, and it's a, it's what it what it is is unscriptural or or contrary to what God wants us to do, Eddie. So I've been warning about this back through the words of Moses. That Moses was told that if a prophet tells you to do something that is in opposition to the law of God, you don't listen to them because they're a false prophet. The very nature of what they're saying defines them as being a false prophet. And that's ultimately what Nehemiah does here. He recognizes this man does not come from God, he's hired by you know, the enemies of God. All right. And that and, and that just just now but I was reminded of in, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet that was, you know, told to go by God to go up to the northern kingdom and prophesy and return without eating or drinking. And on his way back, somebody comes and says, Well, God came and spoke to me and said, You're to come to my house for a meal. And he went to there, even though God had told him not to. And what happened when he left? You remember? He got killed by a lion, right? And so he should have recognized that that prophet was lying or a deceitful prophet. And so but the, the, I think the point that we need to learn from that is that whenever somebody is trying to convince us of something or try to, is, if, if they're trying to get us to sin, then they don't have God's interest in our, not that they're a prophet, but they don't have God's interest in our, in our they don't have God's interest at their heart. Um, any more thoughts or questions on this section? I 
Yeah, and that's what we have to do. We have to be like Nehemiah and do what do like you said, do God's work and not make these other choices that would be sin. All right, let's go ahead and look at uh, 15 through the end of the chapter. So, so the wall was completed on the 25th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. When all our, all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the, with the help of our God. All those in those... Also in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ira, and his son Jehoahan had married the daughter of Meshlam, the son of Barakah. Moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. Then Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. So there's a couple of points that I think we can make here is that the wall is finished in 52 days, which is pretty remarkable. One thing I read, there were 42 different crews working on the wall and they all worked and they got this thing finished. And whenever they did finish it, the people saw they had done this with the help of God. It was clear. And so their enemies at this point are humbled. It says they lost their confidence for they recognize this work had been done with the help of our God. When they worked together with God, the enemies were humbled and God is glorified, right? Because they recognize that they did this with God. Now we still have this Tobiah who is the enemy and he is apparently, he, he well, clearly he has these familial relationships with some of the nobles. And so it says that he's, you know, through marriage, there are people that are bound to him by oath. And he is still trying, for whatever his motives are, I'm not exactly sure, but he's still trying to influence Nehemiah. He's probably jealous of Nehemiah. And so he keeps sending these letters and he's telling, he's having the nobles tell Nehemiah all the good things that Tobiah has done, right? And so we have somebody that's, these nobles are kind of coming in, they're trying to influence Nehemiah's decisions and opinion about this guy. By make, apparently they're, you know, probably telling, you know, lies about these things. And then also secretly they're reporting back to Tobiah all the things that Nehemiah would have said and responded. So here it's kind of like we have, the, it's called like the foxes in the hen house, right? And so the nobles have this unholy relationship with their enemy. Eddie? Little, little illustration or explanation of, of how Tobiah worked and, and how so many enemies of God worked 
His bio was not this outward enemy of God. He wasn't like Pharaoh. He wasn't like uh, you know some of the people that we read about who are sworn enemies of God that everything they do is trying to destroy God. He's someone who was popular with God. He was someone who obviously worked on nurturing his reputation among God's people. And yet Nehemiah is able to see through him. And these are really Nehemiah's personal, it's almost like the germ of these stories. So when Nehemiah is writing about him, he writes about him, about his evil heart, he writes about his evil intent. But what was publicly uh, you know, understood among the people was not that. He was someone who was popular. He was someone who, you know, he and Nehemiah apparently disagreed about things, but there were people trying to try to bring them together, bring them in harmony with one another. And I like your reference to the fox in the hen house. This is a situation where nobody recognized him as fox. And that's what Jesus warns us about, are the wolves in sheep clothing. This is very much the wolf in sheep clothing. Yeah, very good point. And I, and I liken that today to somebody from maybe outside a congregation that calls up or talks to people inside a congregation and tries to tear down that congregation or tear down a member of that congregation. I remember seeing that as a as a as more as a kid. Um, there would be maybe somebody at one congregation would, for some reason, not like somebody at another congregation. And maybe they would go to those people or come to the people and they would just kind of spread rumors about them and say things. And, and it did, it, it just, that's not building up. That's tearing down. Um, Dempsey. The process of doing this work that they said, look at all this rubbish. There's always rubbish. There's always debris. There's always things in the way. But again, you know, you keep trusting God and keep doing God's work and keep moving forward and eventually you see through. It takes time. It takes a lot of time. And nothing succeeds like success. And nothing silences the doubt more than fruit being more. And, and so you've got these antagonists and these doubters and all these people saying all these things, but you just keep working, you just keep doing what God said to do. And eventually, you know, these, these good things happen. And, and for a while, it just seems, what's all this rubbish, man? It's all this greed, all this bad, all this, these terrible things. And yeah, you're going to have them. And, and Satan is going to leave, and he's going to be back. He's going to be Tobiah, coming back, coming back. And uh, <clears throat> the, only, the other thing I can add to that, you know, be patient, know that good things are going to come when you keep trusting the Lord. It's going to happen. The fruit will be there. But the other thing is, when victory does come and, and it's the wall's completed, whatever wall it is that's been torn down, don't let your guard down. Because Satan's going to be back. And so keep your arm with him. Don't take it off. Don't rest. Keep your guard up. Because Satan's going to be back. And so we don't take the arm off until our last breath. Uh, and we're with the Lord. But, you know, give God the glory, but keep your armor on and realize Satan's going to keep thinking you as long as you, you know, as we're alive. And he'll sleep, then he'll be back. And uh, so we have to Yeah, and we're going to see that in the coming chapters where even though the walls are finished, they're going to man those gates, you know. So, all right, we'll start back in chapter seven next week.